रोजमेरी नमस्ते गुड व्हाट शॉल वी टॉक अबाउट दिस मॉर्निंग the nature of performing actions spontaneously now um one has to have the nature to be spontaneous what is that nature mm-hmm. that nature is our personality and uh, the more integrated we are the more less we are mind orientated the less we think or deliberate things the less we preplan things the more spontaneous can we be good people have a habit of mulling over things before they perform an action for example a housewife would wash the dishes 10 times in their minds before they would actually wash it so they've used 11 times the energy instead of just going to the basin and washing them hmm? so if wash the dishes 10 times already in your mind now imagine the amount of energy that has exp- uh, that has been expended by doing that for it has been proven by science that the mind uses eight times more energy than the physical body <laughs> hmm? so what loss now in spontaneity one preserves energy hmm? and one just flows whatever there is for the moment so to be a spontaneous one has to be natural and to be natural is to be here and now hmm? that is why for example i don't prepare any talks talks are just spontaneous they just come out from inside somewhere and i'm only dimly aware of what i'm talking about that is spontan spontaneity everything we find in nature is spontaneous the flower doesn't think of its growth the tree doesn't think of its growth the wind does not plan in which way it is going to blow mm-hmm. when an earthquake happens and a mountain shoots up it does not plan what shape it will be mm-hmm. pointed or square so everything just flows with nature and if we learn to flow with nature not getting away from nature and not fighting nature but flowing with nature then very automatically you become spontaneous in every action now spontaneity must not be confused with impulsiveness hmm? impulsiveness is necessary in certain cases but the impulsiveness could be very negative as well hmm? so the integrated person his actions would always be spontaneous and in the right direction he would not uh, impulsively swear at a person for example hmm? but spontaneously would say some good words and yet rebuke the person reprimand the person hmm? because there's no hatred in his heart so sponta- spontaneity is also linked hmm? with the good nature that is within us which has to be cultivated mm-hmm. spontaneously cultivated and if we study our daily actions of the day 
And if we reflect on it at night before going to bed, we could easily discern that where was I acting deliberately and where was I acting spontaneously. You'd find a definite difference. I thought about this thing. I made effort to do this thing. And therefore, I'm feeling so tired because of the effort I made. But the very work could have been done um, in such a way where it ceased to be an effort, where work has become play, and that play is spontane- spontaneity. So the mind interferes and it says, oh, I have to study this text. Oh, I have to do the cooking. And those very, very thoughts that we have in the mind, a certain kind of disgust in ourselves is produced because of the thinking that I have to do this. I have to do the washing. I have to go to the office and see so many clients. I wish I did not have to do it. Those are the thoughts that arise in the mind. Hmm? And therefore, the work becomes more arduous and uh, it does not become pleasurable. Well, if one knows that, look, I have to go to the office and you just take it from there. It's, it's, it's something which I have to do. I can't escape from it. And then the work you'd be doing in the office would be just spontaneous action, consulting with your clients. And you'd find a greater effect upon the clients that you are to deal with, because you'd be just so natural. And being natural is spontaneous. So where is the nature of spontaneity? The two words mean the same. You just are. And according to your ability or training, you perform the work that you have to do. And then the irk disappears from work. And the W, which is wonderful, is left behind. And that is to be just spontaneous. Hmm? Impulsiveness is comes from conditioning. When a person does an impulsive act, there is a background to it. There is a conditioning to it. Previous acts that one has performed or previous thoughts make one behave impulsively. Hmm? For example, um, um, impulsiveness could be allied to many kinds of phobias or diseases such as kleptomaniacs. Mm. And we've read in papers where a person is a kleptomaniac, uh, the person does not, it's not really a thief. It's a disease and sees something and wants to pinch it. Impulsively. That is not spontaneous. It is a disease. The person is at dis is within himself because his mind functions fragmentedly and not integratedly. So the path to spontaneous action would lie in doing spiritual practices and becoming one's self. To be able to look at oneself in the mirror and know of one's faults and frailties and correcting them. And once that is done, hmm, spontaneity is there. Hmm. Where everything is just accepted as it is, because you have learned to accept yourself. And when you can accept yourself, you can accept the environment around you, the circumstances around you, And in spontaneousness, 
you form a unified whole between you and the environment. Hmm? For nothing is separate from you. So, outer circumstances does not bother you at all. And if it does not bother you, all your actions would naturally be spontaneous. Hmm? Um, <clears throat> someone was talking to me about his sex life. Hmm? Man and wife, they came to see me. They say, the woman says that, uh, Guruji, I am not a frigid woman. And the man says, I'm not an impotent man, husband and wife. But funny enough, um, when we do get together in bed, hmm? uh, we just can't do anything. Hmm? So after questioning them further, I found out that they were thinking about the evening or the night from the morning already. Hmm? Though tonight we're going to be very close to each other. The husband thinks that, the wife thinks that. Hmm? And when the time comes to go to bed, the spontaneity is lost, the flow is lost, because they become too, they are too self-conscious of themselves. Hmm? So I told them, why think about these things at all during the day? Get yourself occupied in work or whatever you are doing, that these thoughts don't arise in your mind. And when you're close to your wife, you just flow to her and she flows to you. And whatever you want to do just happens. So spontaneity is also a happening. Mm -hmm. For everything in life is just nothing else but a happening. And they tried this, this young couple, and they were very successful. Hmm? I said, why plan for the bed only? What's wrong with the living room carpet? Hmm? <laughs> so, pre-planning something. I'm just giving you an example of the people I counsel and what have you. Hmm? So, pre-planning detracts from spontaneous action. Hmm? Because pre-planning could cause, in this case, so many inhibitions, so many repressions. It could cause a sense of inadequacy, insecurity. So, you just let things happen. Hmm? Like the rain that falls cooling the hot, parched earth. Hmm? It just flows down from the clouds. Not fall, rain never falls. It flows. Do you see the difference? We call it the rain is falling. It is flowing down. There is a magnetic attraction, the gravitational force where the rain does not go up, but it comes down in the flow. Hmm? And that is what people require so much in life, is the ability to flow in any circumstances. Hmm? So, when a person finds a secret of being able to flow, then life would assume a different meaning altogether. It would become more harmonious, more joyous. And you will find that all the little things that seem so big to you, the petty little things, uh, where you make a molehill into a mountain, that will disappear. The molehill will remain a molehill. Because the mind is a cunning animal. Hmm? And a small little worry would 
put you off and you exaggerate it to such an extent it becomes unbearable to you. Hmm? Um, there is a function given by the church hmm? and the ladies of the church are asked to bring bake a cake bring a cake for sale at the church for church funds now should we told the sunday and the function is the following sunday and she'll start worrying what kind of cake shall i bake so she wants to do her best so she'll go over recipe book after recipe book a whole week will be consumed by that thought, I've got to bake a cake and it must be great. Hmm? Better than all the other ladies. You go, hmm? must be better than all the other ladies. Cakes. Fine. So the whole week is spent going through all the recipe books and planning this and planning that. And hmm? Do I? Because you want to satisfy your ego and your cake must be better than Mrs. Smith's cake or Mrs. Jones's cake. Hmm? No. Why do that? You have been used to baking cakes. And I'm sure uh, some of the cakes you have baked have turned out to be really wonderful. So stop worrying about that cake and just bake the cake that you know how to bake it. Just do that one. Finish. And say, so if Mrs. Jones's cake is better, so what? Hmm? I've done my duty. I've baked the cake. Huh. So, you know, the whole week's worry would be gone. The concern would be gone. And you'd be acting spontaneously in baking the thing, the thing that you know that you have to do. I tell this to the ladies, to the various courses I go around the world. The dear, kind ladies, you know what they do? Few weeks ahead, they start studying recipes. Will Guruji like this? Will Guruji like that? They go to the shop and buy a whole half a dozen of Indian books, Indian cookery, hmm? Eastern cookery. And they study, 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 study. And yet they know Guruji is a very simple man. Hmm? Anything that's offered on the table. Hmm? by the grace of God, through the cook, because the grace does not descend on its own, it descends via a medium. Hmm? And in this case, the person that cooks is the medium for God's grace to flow. Hmm? Because grace is intangible. It's a force, an energy, a power. Hmm? It has to flow through some object. So in this case, it is the lady. Hmm? Now she goes to all this trouble, trying to hunt up recipes and recipes. Put on the table things that you're used to making. Why bother? Hmm? You see, man does not live by bread alone. But anything that is made hmm, must be done with utter love. Or else I suffer from gases. <laughs> Yes, sir. Now, all these little examples I'm giving you is to illustrate how spontaneous a person can be. Hmm? Right. So you plan on making a certain kind of meal for Guruji today. You look through the cupboards and say, oh, now I want to make this kind of meal, but one ingredient is missing. So you jump into the car and drive five miles to the supermarket or wherever to get that one little ingredient because you want to make that dish. Why not just crunch around in the fridge and the shelves and say, ah, oh, this is there, that's there, that's there, I'll throw this together, that together, that together. It might even turn out better. Who knows? Huh? Spontaneous action. It's not impulsive, not deliberated. So, spontaneity and deliberation of a certain thing or of what is to be done are two opposites. Hmm. 
I take a walk and I see a lady pushing a pram. And, um, and uh, look at the baby, lovely baby. And just spontaneously, without any action, I'll kiss the child's forehead, you know, say a few nice words to the mother, hmm? pushing the perambulator. Spontaneously. Spontaneity is related to love, which just flows. You can't force love. You can't cultivate love. It is just something within you that flows, and the more integrated you are, the greater the flow. Talking of a perambulator, in short, in England we call it a pram. Do you call that here as well? Buggy, baby, buggy. baby buggy. So this old lady was pushing up this baby buggy up a hill. Um, and there was a vicar standing around there and he saw this poor old lady pushing up this baby buggy up the hill and he felt sorry and he said, Madam, may I help you? So the vicar pushed the pram up the hill hmm? for this old lady. So when they reached on top, uh, so she thanked him profusely. Thank you very much for helping me. And so he says, I want a reward. Can I kiss the baby? Says the vicar. <laughs> so the old lady says, baby? What baby? This baby buggy is full of my old man's beer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hmm. This other parson minister had to go to Vancouver City and uh, he couldn't find parking space for his car. So he um, drove around and when he couldn't find parking, he parked in a place where there was no parking. So he wrote a note and put it on the windscreen or windshield and uh, he wrote that I tried high and low to find parking without success. Forgive us our trespasses. Later on, a policeman comes along and he saw this note, and then the policeman too wrote a note. The policeman wrote that the sergeant, sergeant, who will be around here in five minutes, will lead us not into temptation. <laughs> <laughs> so, spontaneity is a way of life. Spontaneity is a way of life. Hmm? You cultivate the way and spontaneity comes of its own. It's like gardening. You take care of the garden, you cultivate the garden and the flowers will grow spontaneously. Huh? because all the conditions for its growth has been prepared aforehand. Hmm? So, we do not plan things. Hmm? A general outline must be made that from Langley we are going to travel to Vancouver. Fine, that's the destination. Finish, period. But as we go along the road, we might want to stop, admire the beautiful cows so serene in the meadows. So we'll stop for a few moments and watch them. Or we pass a park with little children playing. We stop the car and watch them play. I'm very fond of doing that. I could never pass a children's park without stopping for a few moments and watching the innocent play. It is beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful sights one could see. Then as you go along, you might pass some gardens, some lovely homes. You stop, you look. Hmm? Now, these things were not planned. 
This is the only plan he had in mind. We got to reach the planetarium theater to listen to Guruji. He's talking there. Hmm? Or the Robson theater, whatever. Hmm? But the thing is on the way. You can enjoy spontaneously without planning that I'm going to stop here or stop there or stop there. Hmm? The only time people act spontaneously and stop their cars is when they have a puncture. Hmm? They are forced. Hmm? Spontaneity requires no force. Oh. Just to act, to flow with nature. Hmm? For the very nature of spontaneity is nature to be natural, to be yourself, and you do the things that just comes to you. Now, this is no justification for a person with an evil mind who would say, oh, I just killed a person spontaneously. No, he killed a person or stole impulsively. And to be impulsive, uh, as I said before, could be a disease. Disease. Mm -hmm. Good. Another question. Because I've been told that we've got to leave here at half past eleven. Uh, Peter's doing some photography. Okay. You know, I could go very deeply into this, but I am a little confused about the subject of evil. Now, one night you said everything is perfect and really there isn't any. And yesterday you said it would take uh, Hitler a long time to get reborn because he's so evil. And just now you did mention somebody with, with an evil mind might uh, impulsively kill someone. Re Reconcile. Yes, but yes, now, now there is good and evil on the relative plane, on the grosser plane of existence, where one sees the polarity of things and one does not see the wholeness. Now, the two ends of a cane, hmm? A piece of wood has two ends. We only see the two ends. Hmm? And forgetting that it is but one cane. So, in relative existence, there is good and bad. And by good and bad, what we mean is this, that something which is conducive to nature and other things which are not conducive to nature. And that makes it good. That which is harmful to others is evil. Hmm? And that which does good to others and ourselves is good. But from a very higher angle, from the super conscious level, everything is regarded to be the same. For then you do not stand at the two ends of the piece of wood you stand in the center. Mm -hmm. So, as a man develops more spiritually, as he unfolds more to him, everything is the same and everything is perfect. For he realizes that these opposing forces has to be there for the world to function. Mm -hmm. So he might say that this action was not a good action, but he does not condemn the actor. His heart is filled with love for the greatest so-called sinner and the greatest saint. For there is no saint that did not have a past, and there is no sinner that would not have a future. Yes, eh? So it is looking from two different angles. When we look at things from a very mundane, secular, worldly angle, we would definitely see good and bad. But when we rise above that, 
then good or bad disappears. We just see the new, neutral divinity in everything. For even when a man commits a crime, what energy is there that makes him commit the crime? Hmm? Isn't it a divine energy? Hmm? Everything is controlled and energized by this divinity. Hmm? And it depends on the person's state of mind uh, that makes him use the same energy in a good way or a bad way. In a good way would be evolutionary progressive for him, while the bad way would be retrogressive. Hmm? So, when one um, retrogresses, then one has to pay for it. You fall under the law of opposites, you fall in the law of karma, where you are bound by your actions. And then you have to pay for your actions. Good actions bring about good results, bad actions bring about bad results. You can't plant potatoes and expect onions to grow, and you can't plant onions and expect potatoes to grow. Hmm? But when a person has risen above um, worldly, mundane things, when he's reached that spiritual level, then to him everything is holy. Everything is good. He understands that this man has committed a crime, but it might have been necessary for him to commit this crime, to reap the punishment for it, which would better himself. Hmm? For the forces of evolution are forever pushing you on and on and on. So life itself is a paradox, for both the opposites are true. In the one case, we accept the principle of good and evil, and from another standpoint, you say there is no such thing as good, and, then, and there is no such thing as evil. I have told the story of Milarepa many times, uh, Milarepa was a great Tibetan yogi. He wrote in one of his poems that when I was a young man, I used to do black deeds, meaning evil deeds. And when I had some knowledge, gained some wisdom, I did good deeds. But now I do neither. Can I say? When a man reaches a certain height, certain evolutionary height, he becomes a law unto himself. And whatever action he performs becomes non-binding to him. No impressions are left. No sanskaras are formed within himself for which, which he has to work out. He's free while the others are in bondage. To be good is also, also produces bondage. And to be bad also produces bondage. Bondage in the sense that you have done good and that falling within the laws of karma, you will have good rewards. If you do bad, you will have bad rewards. But if you do neither, you have no rewards. That's it. So the other day someone asked me about the various planes of existences from a lower heaven to a higher heaven. Mm -hmm. So, those heavens, as I said, exist in your mind. If you have done good, then naturally your mind would be attuned. Your mind would project itself to a good environment after shedding this body. And if you have done a lot of bad things, naturally it is registered there in the computer of the mind. Mm -hmm. And you, because the mind is fond of projecting, you'll be projecting from your mind a not very conducive atmosphere around you. Mm. And that is hell. 
the other's heaven. But to go beyond hell and heaven, that is self-realization. That is total integration. For hell and heaven, as I said, are only projections of your own thinking abilities and your own thinking mind. <clears throat> and the mind can play a lot of tricks with you. The mind can make you believe things that are not really there. Hmm? And the mind can make you believe things that are really there and it would seem to you not to be there. Do you think I'm really here? Hmm? No, I'm not. <laughs> you'll see this frame, you'll see this body. Hmm? But am I here totally? No. I'm everywhere. Hmm? The farthest corners of the universe. Hmm. At the same very moment, I might be speaking to another group of people in another body. Huh? You see, it depends upon our perception of things. For that spirit is infinite and universal and could never be confined to this little frame, you know, this bit of flesh and blood. Hmm? And they say that uh, its chemical value is just about a dollar. But with inflation, it could be a dollar and a half now. <laughs> so, if there is good and evil on the relative plane of existence, and when one rises above that all, then there good and evil disappears. Hmm? When night comes up, the sun disappears does not mean that the sun is not there. It is shining on the other side of the world. Hmm? It is there. And when the sun comes up, the stars disappear to our sight, but they are still there. Hmm? So both are true. All opposites are true. It depends in what context we speak and from what perspective or from what angle we look at things. These two little girls um, who were discussing the grandmother was about 90 years of age and from morning to night she was reading the Bible. Hmm? Yeah, so the one girl asks the other little girl uh, why is grandmother reading the Bible so much? So the other one replies, oh, she's cramming for her finals. <laughs> <laughs> you see the double meaning in it. Hmm? See the double meaning, how things can be interpreted in two different ways. The other little girl might be thinking that mom is writing some exam. Hmm? for cramming for her finals. Meanwhile, grandmother hmm? knows that she is coming to an end, her life is coming to an end, to the final. Hmm? So she's trying to worship, pray, and study the Bible as much as she could. You see the perspective, the angle we look at things. Hmm. Yes, so in Sunday school, um, in the story of the prodigal son was told. So after telling the story, the um, Sunday school teacher asked, who was not happy at the return of the prodigal son? So one lad stands up and says, the fatted calf. <laughs> yes, the poor thing had to give his life, didn't he? Mm. Now this bishop was walking through the gardens 
when he was looking at the trees and the flowers, and he says, Oh, look at the wonderful work of the Lord. So here one old monk that was on his knees gardening there and working away, he says, you are right, uh, sir, says to the bishop, you are right, your holiness, that it is beautiful, but you should have seen it when he had it to himself. <laughs> so the moral is this, that uh, naturally divinity makes things, everything beautiful, but we have to do something. The gardener has to do his work, and with the help of the Lord and his energy, the garden becomes very beautiful. We cannot allow things to wait and the garden growing full of weeds. Hmm? It would stifle the garden. We've got to put our hand to it, as we have to put some effort in life at first to bring life to an order where we can act spontaneously. Hmm? So after the effort, like a child, a young man like Peter, going to college, studying electronics. It's hard work. I saw some of his books, and when I opened one of them, it all seemed like hieroglyphics to me. You know? Hmm? Right. But after he studied, he knows to him that his play, running these machines or fixing up this, that, or the other. But hard work was required. Now he does it spontaneously, automatically. That's another word for it. It's like when we learn to play the piano, uh, it's with one finger, ping, 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 ping. And then when you're an adept, an expert at the piano, you could hold a deep philosophical conversation with me, and Leslie would still play his Mozart or Bach or Tchaikovsky or whatever. Hmm? And played perfectly. Becomes automatic and spontaneous. Hmm? Good. So, this businessman, he had three trays on his desk. The one tray was marked in, the other tray was marked out. Now, this was in uh, Chetan's office. He has three trays on his desk. One was marked in, the other was marked out, and the third tray was marked LBW. So I asked Chetan, I can understand the in and I can understand the out, but I don't know what does this mean, LBW. So he tells me it means, let the blighters wait. <laughs> yes. This elderly doctor, he had so much work. This elderly doctor had so much work, so he had to get a young partner. So when the doctor went out on his calls, he took the young partner with to introduce him to his patients. So they went first to Mrs. Goodbody, plump lady lying in bed there. So the doctor put a thermometer the old doctor put a thermometer in her mouth and looked at her temperature, but when he was handling it, it slipped out of his hand, it fell to the floor, the thermometer. So he picked it up, and um, when they left the house, the young doctor asked, uh, um, he picked up the thermometer, and he told Mrs. Goodbody that you mustn't eat too many chocolates. Uh, you will recover quicker if you did not eat so many chocolates. So when they left the home, the young doctor asked, hey, that's a delayed reaction, Rosemary. Are you laughing now? Oh, ha, ha. <laughs> 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 so um, the, the, the young doctor asked, uh, wh what made you say you must not eat too many chocolates? So, the old doctor replied that when I bent down to pick up the thermometer, I saw chocolate wrappings under her bed. 
a lot of chocolate wrappings. Fine. So then after that, they made the next call uh, to Mrs. Loveday. Good, so the young doctors, it was his turn to examine Mrs. Loveday, and he put the thermometer in Mrs. Loveday's mouth. And he too, somehow or the other, he took the thermometer out, it, it fell to the floor, and uh, the young doctor picked it up. And uh, he advised the patient, Mrs. Loveday, that you must not be too interested in the church. So when they left the house, the elderly doctor uh, um, was a bit surprised. He says, why should you mention the church to Mrs. Loveday? So the young doctor replies, well, when I dropped the thermometer and went to pick it up, I saw the vicar. <laughs> 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 well, I think Chetanji, you wanted half past eleven, it's half past eleven now. Good. <laughs>